party at the one and only Dre's Beach Club on the Las Vegas Strip. You can join Ty Dolla Sign, that dude Marcellus Wiley, and the entire Speak for Your Speak, speak for Yourself. Oh, you can't. Oh, you, you, you can't. You can't. Pool party. Hey, 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 hey the bachelor. Hey, hey, for tickets and more information, oh, visit Dre's Group. Oh, am I going still? My bachelor party. Oh. The bachelor party. Remember? What is the bachelor going? party. We doing this. <laughs> oh. right, welcome back. Woo. Whitlock and Wiley, <laughs> Jim Jackson and Katino Mobley are back. All right, let's move to Houston, Man. which is exactly Stop. what Russell Westbrook is doing next season. The triple-double machine is taking his act to the up-tempo Rockets, but in order for him to coexist with James Harden, former NBA star Charles Barkley says Westbrook needs to move to shooting guard because the ball will be in Harden's hand and the offense needs to go through him. All right, any chance this will actually work? Absolutely, it's going to work. I thought it was part of the terms in the contract <laughs> in the trade. We give you 171. You know you're playing on guard, right? You know you, you're shooting guard, right? You know that, right? Fine you know print. Right? Not even fine print, bold print. And this is going to be the latest great guard off ball that learns late in his career to develop a shot. I know he's a professional. I know how dedicated he is to the game. He's going to develop a shot. You imagine that guy with that energy on the perimeter or just in the corner gets the ball, develops the shot even further, or uses what he knows, which is the slash to the hole, I think it's going to work beautifully. I think his natural instincts is the two. Mm. Um, he's an athlete, and then James' natural is to facilitate. Mm -hmm. And I think with those two working together with that high energy that Russell has, mm -hmm. I think it's going to work perfectly. I, some people may not believe it, but I, I think... I don't. Uh, yeah, but I think... I um, do that. Yeah, I <laughs> do that. But, um, yeah, you know, him being so aggressive, I think with the ball in James' hand and being able to advance that ball up to him helps his decisions a lot better. Yeah. Two times, I think, in the history, we look at things when, you know, yet dominant ball players kind of stay together. You go back to Clyde, Clyde I mean, Clyde uh, Frazier and Earl Monroe in, mm -hmm. in, in New York when mm -hmm. they won the title. Two ball-dominant guards that kind of figured it out later in their career. There's another time, too, where I see the similarities between Gus Williams and Dennis Johnson. Because mm -hmm. they're two guys that are really not point guards, but figured out ways to play. Gus Williams was more of a scorer, DJ set up and defensively. But... So I say it can work in some instances when guys kind of give up the ego part of it. Mm -hmm. But to me, the key is going to go back to this. What are they going to run? What is Mike D'Antoni going to put in place to make this thing work together? Because we know right. in Mike's system, it's a ball-dominated point guard right. mm. that runs everything. Right. So before I say yes or no, I like to see exactly the strategy behind what Mike D'Antoni is going to implement. To tweak his offense yeah. enough, because I think what Russ can be great off the ball. Right. On that second and third yeah. pass on the weak yeah. side, now he goes to work. Okay, but I, I want to really see how they break down I offensively. I think they're going to roll back to that OKC early on when Russ... But, but, but you know, but here's the thing. That's OKC. Mike you know I'm saying? They're going to roll back as far as the plays. See, because what, what, what Greg Popovich does is he'll run his system, but he'll tweak something else for that new player that comes in. You know what I'm saying? Have but we seen that with Mike D'Antoni? I don't know, but see? I'm saying because, because he's because he's succeeded, but yet not deep in playoffs right. as he should have, with the offense being so powerful during the regular season, I think now he's hopefully he'll go to his office, go to his staff and say, you know what? Let me tweak this a little bit. Let me bring a couple of these different offenses in because James and Russell was pretty good at OKC together. Let me see if I can add a couple of those plays in and see how this works. And that may be the problem mm -hmm. because Russell Westbrook may say, hey, we were successful in OKC together and I was the point guard. No, no. James in the fourth quarter controlled the ball in OKC with Kevin Durant and Russell on the wings <clears throat> in OKC. That's what happened. And they did pretty well, mm -hmm. but they were young. You're not concerned that Russell Westbrook can't shoot? Uh... <laughs> look, look, everybody, everybody's uh, like that. You said, well, catch it, catch it, shoot, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. All right, before we go, <laughs> I'd like to congratulate Secret Deodorant for its frugal publicity stunt. Mm. The antiperspirant brand spent a half million dollars on $20 million worth of brand awareness. That's right. Secret gave each member of the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team $23,000 for the right to use them in a clever marketing ploy. The alleged benevolence was trumpeted in the New York Times as a bold move in the fight for equal pay for women. It was a bold and cheap move to promote Secret. Mission accomplished. The mainstream media followed its leader, the New York Times, and heralded the donation as another musket fired <laughs> in the war for equality. Secret implored the U.S. Soccer Federation to be on the right side of history. Let's take this moment, they said, of celebration to propel women's sports forward. We urge the U.S. Soccer Federation to be a beacon of strength and end gender pay inequality once and for all. Well, I'd like to take this moment to dispel the notion that being on the right side of history 
is some sort of noble ambition. It's not. Winners write history. Man writes history. The understanding of history is fluid and up to the discretion of those in power. You think Native Americans tell the same history as the settlers who conquered this land? You think Russians believe we were the deciding factor in World War II? More important than all of that, do you think Martin Luther King Jr. and the leaders of the Civil Rights Movement called on people to be on the right side of history, or did they call on people to be on the right side of God? Faith-based morality has been at the core of American progress. If you read Ed Henry's book on Jackie Robinson, you'll learn that faith, not speculation about what historians would one day say, powered the baseball great. I want the U.S. Soccer Federation to ignore historians and do what's right. Doing what's right is difficult. Doing what's right oftentimes requires rigorous debate. The people campaigning for decisions based on the judgment of historians seem to have no interest in debate and no understanding of how capitalism works. At this point in American history, the demand for women's athletics is not equal to the demand for men's sports. That disparity in demand is at the heart of pay disparity. The same factors in the beauty industry have created an enormous pay dis disparity between female and male models. Giselle Bungeon is significantly richer than her husband, Tom Brady. Through the Title IX legislation, America has invested untold billions in women's soccer. We've produced the 